Hi, everybody. I'm Martha Seelman. I'm the executive director of Studio Art Quilt Associates, or SACWA. And we are one of four organizations that host textile talks. So um, we work with Service Design Association, the Quilt Alliance, and the International Quilt Museum to put on these talks every week. All of us at SACWA are really excited right now because next week, next Thursday, will be the start of our annual benefit auction. All of the works are donated. They're all 12 inches square. And all of the proceeds go to support SACWA's Traveling Global Exhibitions Program. This year, we have 17 exhibitions of about 30 pieces each that are traveling all over the world to be enjoyed by audiences everywhere. I hope you'll go to saqa.com slash auction and take a look at the almost 400 gorgeous works of art that will be up for bid starting next Thursday. Hope to see you there. So today, um, our speaker is Maria Schell, so longtime SACWA member. Um, and Maria is famous for her work that is based on traditional quilting, but is very much her own artistic variations on that. Um, she recently had a solo exhibition at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont called Off the Grid. And I think that's really the best way to describe Maria's work is that she's taking those traditional grid-based quilt designs and taking them off the grid and doing really exciting things with them. Her book, Improv Patchwork Dynamic Quilts, is a wonderful way to enjoy some of the ways in which Maria takes those uh, patterns and does really new and unusual things with them that you can experiment with also. However, there's another aspect to what Maria does. She also um, organizes and leads community quilt projects. And that's what I'm really excited to learn about today um, because that's not only creating a quilt, but it's also organizing an entire community, which is a whole other set of skills. And Maria does a beautiful job with that. As Maria is doing her presentation, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box or in the chat, I'll be moderating. Um, so I'll watch to see for your questions. <clears throat> And at the end of Maria's presentation, she'll answer as many of them as she can. So um, sit back, enjoy. This is going to be a fantastic hour together. So I think I'm up. Um, thank you, Sakwa and Textile Talks for inviting me to share um, this lecture with you. So what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to pull the lecture up and hopefully um, we will not have any glitches like we are having right now. So as Martha mentioned, um, I uh, this lecture is called Building Community Through Quilts. And as Martha mentioned, the, these are, I wanted to show at the beginning a couple quilts that are really uh, maybe that you've seen before or that you recognize as the type of work I do because the community quilts are a whole nother area that, that a lot of people don't even know that I do. This quilt's mirror ball, it was part of the Shelburne exhibit and they actually purchased it. So it um, is part of their permanent collection, which I'm very grateful for that. And this quilt, everything all at once. Um, the, uh, the quilt you just saw, Mirror Ball, is based on the traditional quilt block called Cross Squares. And this is based on the traditional quilt block called Flowering Snowballs. And then one of my more recent works here is Liminal Lines, which is um, a lot of times I work directly from this giant laundry basket of scraps. And this quilt came from that. So these are all quilts you may have seen before. Um, and that it's typical of the kind of work I do. 
now uh, for the story about how about community quilts. So I've divided this into three sections. And the first section is really how did I come to make community quilts? And the second section is how, how to do it, like how I make these quilts and how you could also make these quilts. And then the final uh, section, which is the longest, is sort of some stories behind some of the community quilts that I've made. So many, many years ago, um, our family moved to Valdez, Alaska, which is a small port town in, it's the terminus of the Alaskan pipeline, which is part of why we moved there, is that my husband worked, originally worked on one of these little tugboats Escorting, escorting the oil tankers in and out of Prince William Sound. And that is his profession. He has since moved on. He still works for the same company, but he's more involved in logistics than he is actually in being on a tugboat, which is I'm very grateful for because in the beginning, he was gone for weeks and weeks at a time. Um, one of the distinctive characteristics of Valdez is that it is the snowiest town in North America. There are snowier places, but nobody lives there. And to put that in perspective, this is my oldest son who is now 25, but he and his friend Sean are playing in the snow. And this is our two-story two home. And those are the second story windows. So you get an idea of how much snow that is. And I say this because I'm, I'm trying to sort of paint this picture remote Alaskan village, husband gone all the time, tons and tons of snow, three little boys to take care of. And I was kind of miserable, but there was one thing that was sort of a shining light in my life. And that was quilt making. I've always made quilts, but I mean, I've always sewn, but I hadn't made a quilt before I moved to Valdez. And there's a little quilt shop there called the Calico Whale. And this is my very first quilt. Um, it was a mystery quilt. I went into the shop with my bag of upholstery, vintage upholstery fabrics. And um, I learned the hard way how difficult it is to get a quarter inch seam if you're working with upholstery fabrics. And from there, I, um, I just became obsessed with making quilts. And, I think this is a good place to talk a little bit about Gwen Marston because this is one of the very first books that I read as a quilt maker. And it, as the title indicates, liberated quilt making. It was all about sort of going off the grid and being improvisational and working with what you have. And that really resonated with me. So I'm a new quilter. I've been exposed to this sort of improvisational type of quilt making. And I had a bunch of little jobs that were sort of based on my husband's schedule. And one of them was that I worked, I was the toddler activity coordinator for Valdez Parks and Rec. And that meant I ran a program called Mighty Mites and all of the toddlers in town would come into the rec center, couldn't play outside because there was way more snow than they were not tall enough. Uh, and we had all this equipment, you know, playground type equipment um, that was indoors and I would, I got to become, I became friends with a lot of moms and I would start to collect quilt box and assemble them into these quilts that were sort of welcoming these babies into our world. And they, uh, I was obsessed with making them because I, I love the challenge. You know, a lot of times when people do a community quilt, there are all these stipulations, everything has to be the same size. And then the, then the person who puts it together uses the same size sashing and it all just goes together really rigidly. And I, I welcomed the idea of having these different size blocks and assembling them using patchwork and bright colored fabrics. And I, I just, I made a lot of these and most of them ended up on people's walls. So they weren't really used as utility quilts. And what I always say when, you know, people say, well, I use my quilts and I think when you put them on the wall, you use them too. It's just in a different way. You use them for enjoyment and satisf satisfaction and beauty. And as I was making these quilts, I realized, and this is a more recent one. Actually, I shouldn't say recent. Elena is now a teenager. Um, 
that as I was making them, I realized that the only people that could participate in the quilt were people that knew how to do piecework or applique that were actually quilters. And if I could devise a method for bringing a community together and having them make quilt blocks, even if they didn't know how to make a quilt or how to sew. And this, you know, I, I didn't invent it, but I, um, I took this particular quilt making technique, which is fusible applique and adapted it to my own purposes. And that is what I'm gonna share with you now. So the way that you could make a traditional a, a community quilt in the method that I do is by following these simple instructions. And I will mention now that um, at some point in the chat, there will be a PDF of all of this information. So you can look for that PDF as well as if you signed up for the lecture, you will receive the PDF when you receive uh, the recording. So I like to use Wonder Under and I use Wonder Under because it has a backing and that allows me to prep the fabric. And I typically prep a 10 inch by 17 inch strip of each color of fabric. So the information you see up here at the top, those are all fabrics that I have prepped and I have arranged artfully according to the color wheel. Um, you can see that there's a lot of different types of geometric prints. There are lots of uh, fabric that reads like solids, just a whole array giving uh, the participants a lot of options. And I usually purchase an entire bolt of Wonder Under, which is also known as Pelon 805. And I will, my, I have a sort of sourdough starter of leftovers, but every time I do a community quilt, I'm going to add an entire bolt to the stash of prepped fabrics. So, which would be how many yards is that? 20 yards. And then in addition to the prepped fabric, and I'm going to stress this. When I first started doing these community quilts, I had this idea, well, I'll let people just pick their fabric and then put the wonder under on it themselves. Unfortunately, what happened, and it, it is kind of surprising, but you surprising the number of things that people can glue wonder under to the ironing board, the wrong side of the fabric themselves, the iron. Um, so I quickly realized that I need to do that prep work in advance. The other thing that you want to do in advance is that you want to create the background squares that the participant is going to glue their design onto. And that's what is up here in the upper left hand corner. I like to make those blocks all different sizes because that forces me to be more creative in the way that the quilt is put together. I also think it's really key. Um, just over time, I figured this out that you take, you can use packing paper. Um, one time I didn't have any access to packing paper and I used grocery uh, lunch bags. And you just want to create, I think of this as their design surface. It is their little area that they're going to be, they're going to put their square of fabric on top of and that they can do their designing from that piece of brown paper. The reason why we, I use that is that at the moment when they are ready to iron their information, their design onto their block is very helpful if they have a substrate underneath their block that they can carry the block to the ironing board. So carrying this piece of paper with their design on it uh, results in the design safely making it to the ironing board. You also wanna have a bunch of scissors um, I personally think these Fiskar with the pointed, with the point, the, do, the rounded ones will work as well, but you can buy a six pack or a 12 pack of those for very, you know, under $20. And then um, you have plenty of scissors. And then of course, some sort of permanent marker that they can sign their name. And at the time that you are sort of instructing people on how to make their blocks, if you can emphasize to them that they need to sign their name somewhere in the center of the block, not near the outer edges, because the quarter inch around, and sometimes even more than that, are going to disappear. So you want to encourage them to put their signature somewhere where it's not going to get lobbed off in the construction process. 
You also want to have some ironing boards and some irons. I prefer to have steam in the irons. You really want to have good hot irons. And then at the ironing board, I also have a couple of these pieces of brown packing paper to protect the ironing board surface and hopefully to protect the iron as well. So how do they make the blocks? What they're gonna do, and this is just a sample that I made, is they're gonna select fabrics that they want. If you can, encourage them to cut their little bit of fabric out of the edge of the fabric, work from the edge into the center. I don't know how many times I've had uh, participants because these people don't, they don't know um, the quilting process and they don't necessarily um, think about things in the way that a quilter thinks about things. So if you can encourage them to cut their piece of fabric from the edge of the fabric rather than cutting from the very center of the fabric, that is helpful. So I've cut out all these different little squiggly sun rays and I've got my center of my sun. And by using the Wonder Under, it's going to be easier for the participant to cut their shape out because it's backed by that paper backing. And then they can arrange it how they want it on the background. And I would say this is not very good. Over here on the left hand side, you see how I've got my point of my sun ray going all the way to the edge. I actually should shift the entire design so that it is not coming up against the edge. Another thing that's really important to stress to participants is four layers or less, and you might even want to say three layers. I actually have had people, um, which is another good thing to re remind people, that I typically, when I set up the room for a community quilt building party, I will have the brown paper, and then I will put a plain block of fabric, and I have that set up beforehand, and I have the fabric going down the center of the table with the pins and the scissors and little containers um, so that there are a couple every few participants. I've had a few people who when they get their block of fabric that they're going to be using for their substrate for the base, they don't like it. So their idea of how to change it is to glue an entire piece of other fabric on top of it. So you want to try and avoid that deter that from happening. So um, encourage them to glue less than four layers. So the top, the bottom layer is one layer and then it right here, like right here, I've actually got three layers and some places I have four if I've got my little sun rays overlapping. Once they get the design the way they want it, they're gonna do, they're gonna remove this release paper. And what the release paper does, once it's removed, is it exposes the glue. And this might be something that you want to share with participants, is that this is a heat activated glue. So once you remove the release paper, it is it has a sticky feel to it. If it doesn't have the sticky feel to it, that means that there's probably what happened is that the glue is still attached to the release paper. And there are ways to deal with that. Um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So you've really taken all of the release paper off. You have your base, which is the brown paper, and you have your design, and it's all ready to iron. At that point, you're going to go to the ironing station. You're going to carry that all over to the ironing station. And you'll notice here, I'm going to use my cursor. I've got the brown paper underneath. I have my design in the center, and then I put another piece of brown paper on top. Now, if you have pressing sheets, or parchment paper, those are wonderful to use because you can actually see your design. But if you're in a situation where you don't have them or you don't want to purchase those things, the brown paper works just fine. So the first time I'm gonna press my design, I'm going to press it. And I think um, it's important to stress that your pressing is not moving quickly back and forth over your project. The pressing should actually be a very slow and steady movement of the iron because what the iron is doing is remember it's a heat activated adhesive so you need to get the iron needs to get hot enough and it needs to be on that piece of fabric long enough to heat up that adhesive so that's the first time i press it now i'm also going to press it from the back so i'm going to flip over the design remove the top parchment plate the the brown paper and then press it again at some point in this process i encourage the participant to take their block and shake it 
And the reason why I want them to do that is that any component of their design that they failed to remove the, uh, the release paper or any element that does not have the adhesive on the back is gonna fall off the block. And at that point, then we, you need to come in and take the release paper off, tuck it back into the design and press again. If there is no adhesive on the back of that little piece of fabric, what I typically do is I will take and snip off a little bit of the Wonder Under that hasn't been attached to another fabric, just the Wonder Under by itself. And I'll pull the adhesive off and I'll tuck it into the design and then I'll press it again. And then finally, you're going to press it from the top. And after that, the person should sign their block. And that's another reason I usually have um, some just plain fabric with freezer paper ironed onto it to allow people to practice signing their block. And that is also a good little tip. All right. I have come to understand that many people, unfortunately, many people in this world rarely get to tap into their creativity. And holding a community quilt block project um, often brings together a lot of people that don't have creativity or creative activities in their regular life. And when you set up an environment where they can be creative, they often kind of lose their brains. And they will, you can say to them, we need to keep the paper all, we need to keep the fabric all organized. Put, you know, if you put your scissors in the tubs, then people can find the scissors. But that just goes right over their heads because they are in the zone. And I think those of you who are makers out there understand what that zone feels like. And I used to get really frustrated. It's like, why can't people listen to what I'm saying? But now I think of it as, wow, I when I see this mess, I know that people are engaged and enjoying the process. And I feel like really um, grateful that I have created a situation where people do get to tap into their creativity. And at this point, I should say, I'm going to show you a lot of photographs as I tell these stories of these community quilts that I've been fortunate that many of these quilts have been documented by professional photographers, which is really cool because the images look really good. And um, this photo is kind of a funny story because it's, it's me and my friend Nancy Cook, and we've done a lot of things collaboratively, including working on this particular quilt, which I'll tell you the story of in a little bit, um, is that it is useful to have one person designated as the decision maker and it really should be the person who is in charge of the quilt and sometimes those lines can get blurred but to think about that going into the project because when you do something with the community there are going to be a lot of people that are going to have opinions um, but it really comes down to the person who's going to put the quilt together so now I'll tell you a couple of quilt stories. And this is the first one, which is the first community quilt that I made. And it was for an organization called Thread, which is a, the nonprofit, Alaska nonprofit that connects uh, low, low income families with small children. It connects them with quality daycare and early education learning opportunities. And it's a really amazing program. Um, it's statewide. And the executive director contacted me. She, her, her son and my son were friends. And she knew that I had done these baby quilts, these community baby quilts, and that I was a professional quilt maker. And she thought it might be interesting if I made a community quilt to celebrate their 25th anniversary as an organization. So we had a couple of meetings, which can also be helpful if you're if you're doing a community quilt for an organization to sort of establish the parameters of that quilt. What do you what do you want the story of that quilt to be? In this case, they were celebrating 25 years and they also um, had a lot of stakeholders and a lot of people invested in their programs from the legislature to the public library system to um, 
the homeless shelters or all, all these different organizations. And they wanted to tell that story of how they're interconnected and how um, and the and the services they provide from education to childcare to reading opportunities, all these really cool things. And this is the finished quilt. At the time, I you know it's the first one that I did, and it's really the most closely related to the children's quilts in that I had I sort of framed each block. They're all different sizes, and they have these colorful frames around them, and. I, I love this quilt because I love the story behind it. I also, you know, it's, I always say this about my quilts that it's sort of a document of where I was at that time and how, you know, I, I feel like I've gotten better at doing community quilts since this first professional one. Um, oftentimes you will have children involved in making the quilt blocks and children, tend to get like want to do it but want to get it done I mean you'll have you'll have the budding artist that will spend a long time sort of contemplating their quilt block but a lot of times they've got a lot of things to do and they want to make their block and they want to get on with the next thing that they're going to do and one thing I do with kids is just encourage them to use the scraps there a lot of times people cut up shapes and their leftovers and the kids will gravitate towards arranging those leftovers which is what my son Tripp did in this particular quilt block, which are, you know, it's super fun, right? He was five years old and it's a pretty cool block. All right. I made uh, the next couple quilts that I, community quilts I made were made in a McCarthy, Alaska. And that's where I actually am right now. I'm in our cabin, which you'll see a photo of in just a second. To get to McCarthy, there's a 60 mile dirt road poorly maintained dirt road and that's what that photo is here and this is also a quilt that I made representing that road. Um, this is our cabin. This is where I am right now. Unfortunately the sun is not shining but I'm sitting in this cabin right now and across the street from our cabin. This cabin was built in 1920. Um, back in the day McCarthy was a gold mining town. Uh, now it is um, in it's part of a national park, the Wrangell St. Elias National Park. But right across the street is, oh, that's me in my, uh, I call it off the grid solar she, she shed, which I'm not there now because it's too noisy to give a lecture. And you can see there are holes in the wall, but this is where I, I make quilts in the summertime. So across the street is the Wrangell Mountain Center. And actually, I just heard this morning that a bear got into the Wrangell Mountain Center. I don't know what happened this morning or last night. And so they were busy boarding up any, any access for bears. They were trying to shut it down. So the Wrangell Mountain Center is a environmental educational, um, environmental educational arts. Um, I'm saying this wrong. Environment, education, and arts. Those are the things that they support. In fact, right now, there is a a week-long college program going on where the college students are doing research projects. We also have an artist in residency program and this organization is the second place that I made a community quilt. Um, I like to share this photo because it gives you a really good idea. This is artist Mavis Muller. She's a Homer Alaska artist. She's a burning artist. I know Burning Man just wrapped up She's been funded by Burning Man. She makes these beautiful indigenous material sculptures and then she lights them on fire. This is uh, solstice, which is the longest day of the year. And I just wanna point out how we're all dressed because that is summer in Alaska. Um, so Wrangell Mountain Center had a week long event called Creative Cross Pollinations. And uh, this is the first time I sort of worked in I worked live to build a quilt so we had um, a visual artist that's Margot class right here a performance artist Johnny Gray up here Margot class's husband Frank Sos and then my friend Nancy Cook who was the program director we all so there's performance art writing book making and quilt block making all happening within and writing I did I say that anyway all these events are going on and we've got all these students and they're just it was like the most bonkers thing ever and um everyone made 
quilt blocks. And then I put them together into this larger community quilt, which you'll see right here. And it's called McCarthy Day. One of the things I like to do um, now when I make a community quilt is I will often mimic if someone makes a block that has a mountain, then I will do a pieced version of the mountain. Or if someone makes a tree, then I will do a pieced version of the tree. And that can be kind of a cool way to have this discussion between that sort of surface design and pieced work. And here's a close up of some of these quilts. Now, I, I should also say that when I, these quilts are made for the wall, so they're not used. I mean, we look at this, little teeny Allison did these little teeny she cut out all these little shapes I quilt all of those down with my long arm I call this custom light the type of quilting I do here which is usually pretty heavily quilted using I don't change my threads I use a light colored thread and I quilt the whole thing with the same color thread but I do stitch every single little Little teeny thing down so that it does not fall off. And occasionally um, there will be a, a piece that didn't have any adhesive on it. So it's really important that you glue it down. And this is the last block from this quilt. I always like to say, who knew Mother Nature had lavender breasts? But she did. Um, and in this particular quilt, I did not set parameters on what well, I did. This is what I said. What do you want to say about yourself that you want stitched into a larger quilt? So the blocks were very different. You know, this particular person, Lindsay Pepper, see how she nicely signed her name right there. I just come back from working in an orphanage in Africa and she really wanted to celebrate motherhood and the value of being a mother. And so that's her contribution to the quilt. And then it's my challenge to sort of figure out how to put all these different voices together in a way that says something that, you know, that celebrates that community. About two years after I made that quilt, which was all students that were participating in the uh, Creative Cross-Pollinations workshop, I did one with the community. And that is, it was a rainy day like it is today. And people went across the street at the hardware store. And so these are all community members and they are all saying things about this wilderness community that we live in. One of my favorite blocks is this one made here by Christine Johnson, who is a fisherwoman and a forager and a canner and a preserver. So she's got a, a jar of jam. And then this is her dip netting for Copper River red salmon. And this quilt is McCarthy Solstice. So there are two McCarthy quilts. One is owned by the Wrangell Mountain Center and one is owned by the museum. So if you happen to visit the Wrangell St. Elias National Park, um, you could visit the museum and see this quilt, which is called McCarthy Solstice. I still help people make community quilts for babies. And this is, a, I'd like to share this because it's not, I don't um, necessarily follow through on the entire quilt, but I often will host the block party and then some other young quilters will take over piecing the quilts together. And then often they will come to my house and quilt it on my long arm quilting machine. And here is an example of one of those quilts. Um, I call this Max's man quilt because it is almost entirely men who um, are involved in making the quilt blocks for this, which is kind of cool. Max's dad is an EMT. And so there are lots of references to um, just crazy Max's man quilt. All right. One of my favorite stories um, is of the community quilt I made at the McCall Center for Art and Innovation in Charlotte, North Carolina. So this was a two month long residency that I did. It's the only residency I've ever done. Um, and we knew that because I'm a quilt maker and because I have this practice of doing community quilts that what I would do while I was in residence is that I would make a community quilt with a community in Charlotte. What I didn't know prior to getting there is that um, I would work with the residents of Moore Place. And of course I was asked if I wanted to do this and I did, 
Um, More Place is a housing first project for formerly chronically homeless individuals. So everyone that lives here, they have little studio apartments, um, uh, is offered wraparound services. So they have access to education, to um, developing job skills, to dealing with drug and alcohol addiction, to dealing with PTSD. Like, so there's social workers and people that are just helping them um, improve their own lives. And I had worked at the woman's shelter in Valdez. So I was, I, I'd had some experience working with marginalized communities before, but this, this was different. Um, so what I did is every week I packed up my sewing machines and my ironing board. And I, I should say that Nancy Cook, um, who is a quilt artist in Charlotte, North Carolina was downsizing and she had heard about this and she contacted me and said, hey, do you want a bunch of fabric? And I said, yes, that would be awesome. So I had a bunch of fabric that was donated to me by a local artist and we, and I'm just gonna sort of scare these, uh, these images. These are the images of the residents making their quilt blocks, but I'm just, as we're looking at these, I'll tell you a little bit about how the process went. So it was a two month long process. And in the beginning I showed up um, and I, I thought about it, you know, it's like, oh, I, we need to make something first, right? So I got it in my head, we'd make pillowcases. Well, I totally lucked out because there is a dollar store nearby that sold pillows, but the dollar store did not sell pillowcases. So word got out on the street that this lady was showing up and helping people make pillowcases. And you'll notice in this particular photo that up here, it's kind of a catwalk. And I never, I didn't notice that there was a catwalk up here. This is where the apartments are. But people were checking us out and they're like, wait a minute, these people, this lady's making pillowcases and I can learn how to make pillowcases. I can get a pillowcase. And then we started mending and then we made tote bags. And it was just this really cool experience. And I had social workers on site say that there were people that participated in this particular um, event that hadn't participated in any other social activities. Um, the, and I thought about that a lot and I have come to realize, and I think most of you who are here would probably agree with me that the quilting, textiles, sewing, and doing those things in community uh, is powerful. And that almost everyone has a positive memory of sewing in their lives. So even if their lives were not necessarily full of positive memories, that sewing usually is one. And I should also say that the, interestingly, the number of people who participated, it was, it was about 40% men, 60% women which I don't think we would have expected that going into it, that there would be so many men that enjoyed the experience. And a lot of them didn't necessarily sew, but they came in and they hung out. So it was a very, it was, it was a really cool community event. And we then had two sessions where we worked on quilt blocks and I had shown them other quilts that I'd made. And we had a discussion about how this all might go down and what they, and the idea was for them to share their personal experience about being a resident of more place and however they wanted to express themselves. So I ended up with all these really amazing blocks. I was also really surprised at how hopeful and joyful the blocks were. It wasn't it was really very, the quilt itself is very forward looking. Um, there was a lot of gratitude from the residents of Moore Place for the opportunity to be a resident of Moore Place. And then I went home to Anchorage and I had to sort of sort out how I was gonna put this into a quilt. A quilt, and this is another thing I should say, if you're gonna do one of these quilts, if you end up with about 30 blocks, you're gonna have a big quilt. Most of these quilts are um, huge. Like I'm gonna say 
80 by 100, 85 by 110. So they're really large quilts. And you can see here's my measurements. This is my sketch. And weirdly, I had originally thought I might do the Charlotte skyline, which is a really beautiful skyline. And I struggled with that. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how I'd put the blocks into a skyline. And then I realized that is a dumb, that was a dumb idea. That was a really dumb idea because the skyline in some ways represents homelessness. You know, it's, it's living in an urban environment without a home. And really, I don't know what sort of hit me over the head. It's like, this quilt is about home. It's not about a city skyline. And I suppose I sort of resisted it because I thought that it was um, it's too simple, like kind of, you know, just a, a little house and a tree. Then, so the next step, but I went with it. So the next step really is for, I call it what I, I call it concentrating color. So I designated the blocks based on their backgrounds are put in different areas. So the green became the tree and then the pink and the red became the house with the blue door. And then it's got a purple black roof. And you, this gives you an idea of the scale of the quilt. And I just pieced and pieced and pieced and pieced. This is installing the quilt, which is pretty cool to see. And then you can see this picture of me underneath it. And then um, this is a plaque here, really commemorating everyone who was involved in making the quilt. One of the things I really wanted to do which we did, which was super cool is, and this is my photographer right there, Ben, um, is we had a first Friday event. So we served snacks and there, everyone was publicly recognized for their participation in the quilt and the quilt is installed and lives in the foyer in the front area of Moore Place. So if you want to, you can go to Charlotte, North Carolina and see that quilt. It was a really, really uh, amazing thing. The other thing I like to tell about this particular quilt is that the, you know, people are like, oh, housing first project, you know, giving people homes. Um, some of my most active participants in the quilt couldn't attend the uh, the opening, the artist reception because they were working. Um, the program really works. And these are a lot of the people that were involved in making quilt blocks. And I should also say that the stakeholders, so McCall Center, More Place, some of the other volunteers that are involved actively in More Place, um, participated in made quilt blocks so super cool and that is home is home this is quilts called home and I have put the measurements here but they are kind of approximate um I know I should do a better job of documenting my quilts okay um I've got two more stories to share um this one is the story of stitched and this is Paula Kavarik and that's a, one of her quilts right there and Paula Kavarik is a very well-known quilt artist. She does a lot of really interesting things. Her quilts are often three-dimensional. She often cuts them up and reassembles them. She's very fearless. And she lives in Memphis, Tennessee. And she um, had this idea, which is kind of, to me, mind-boggling and overwhelming, but that she would do a two-month-long celebration of the quilt. And it was called Stitched. And it was all to take place at Crosstown Concourse, which really interesting is that this concourse was originally a Sears and Roebuck uh, distribution center. And when Sears and Roebuck went belly up, it became a dilapidated old building. And then these entrepreneurs, artists, and architects came in and decided, wow, this is an incredible facility. We can do some really cool things with it. And the um they built apartments and there's an artist in residency there's a gallery there's an amphitheater there's a radio station there's a school there's just all these amazing things happening in this large facility and Paula uh had this vision that she would do stitch celebrating the art of quilting and one of the events for that two-month-long celebration was to make a community quilt and 
let's see just to give you an idea of the size of this facility and the just the space incredible um so i showed up and i i think of this as kind of as a mini residency i did a lot of prep work when i got there and then i um this is where we had we had two we had one day that was a complete two sessions of quilt block making and I like this sign here, which I think I put on the next slide. Help us build a quilt, community quilt workshop. And I'm going to go back again for just a second. This, in some ways, is like a fishbowl. And that's where we spent. Um, we had the block making parties. And then I had a team that we worked together to build the quilt. So here is the block making party. Everything's all set up. We had a session in the morning and a session in the afternoon. Uh, my recommendation is that you make the session should be at least two hours long, two to three hours. Um, some people take a really long time to make their blocks, and some people are, you know, really fast. So the um, the idea behind the quilt is that it's a community quilt, but that it celebrates Memphis, and so all these quilt blocks are made. Um, as a celebration of the community of Memphis. And this was my hardcore team here, Paula Kavarik, Nisha Nielsen, and Sarah Terry. So this is the first time I had worked with a team and uh, I learned so much from that process. I, I feel like I made some mistakes and you know, but we learn from our mistakes, right? So this was a big project and it's the first time I had to try and delegate things. And I, you know, I wasn't that great at it. Um, I learned, well, I said, I learned a lot, right? So here are my blocks or here are the community blocks, all of them up, a lot of them. And so we had spent that day making the blocks and that night I was sort of wandering around Memphis by myself. And I was trying to think of what, wow, how what are we going to do like how am i going to put these blocks together how so that they're that they are amazing so that they honor this community and i kept seeing these fun sort of like there was a lot of like there was memphis beer and there were these mem pops and there was all this sort of um and looking at the blocks like these were all things that um people were sharing in their quilt blocks and i i was like i don't know i don't know what i'm gonna do and then uh, it came to me that night, I was like, I think, I think we should spell out Memphis. And these are all like leftover units that I brought with me. And this of course is the team. And the, you know, we're working in this fishbowl, right? Which was kind of cool because people could, people were bringing tours in, like little kids come and tour the cross uh, Concord, um, Crosstown Arts and they um, would come in and uh, it was really fun to say, what do you, you know, what do you think, what do you think is going on with this quilt? And if you look at it, eventually people were like, wow, you know, it's going to spell Memphis. And I like to share this. This is Sandy, who was a queen of construction. So if you're going to do a community quilt and if you're going to do it with a team, it's really nice to have someone who is really good at piecing things and is tenacious and is willing to work through the hard stuff, which we all know those big seams at the end are very painful. And Sandy was the person who took that on and I'm very grateful to her. So here's the quilt top. Um, I love this photo, not only because you get an idea of how large the quilt is, but there's this beautiful display of all these quilts that were another part of the event that uh, Paula organized. There's Paula right there. That these are all quilts made by people who are quilt makers in the vicinity of Memphis. They are all blue. They are all 30 inches, and they just make this really powerful display. And then here is the Memphis quilt, which lives um, at Crosstown Arts. So it's pretty cool. Um, that. You know, for me, there's a direct lineage between the home quilt and the Memphis quilt. Both of them involve um, concentrating color and sort of um, saying something that's really bold and graphic that's related to the community. So let me give you a close up. All of this is sort of pieced, uh, tonal, um, 
and allows you to really see the letters. Um, oh, I have two stories. These are quick stories, though. So this is um, I worked with the Social Justice Sewing Academy, which is an amazing organization that uses, as it says, art empowerment advocacy. Um, a lot of working with youth and teaching them how you can use your art as a means of advocating for social justice. So I spent a weekend in San Francisco. This is the team I worked with there. Um, and we were at Bay Quilts, which is a really cool quilt shop in the San Francisco area, Berkeley area. Uh, this is a quilt I made a long time ago called Colors Unfurled, which is an American flag. And the reason I'm sharing it is because as we were sort of working as a team, we had a lot, we had all the blocks were already made and we had to figure out a way to organize them. And the participants, my team, uh, was interested in this idea of making a flag. So we had, these are our design walls and we started to sort of organize the different blocks into strips or stripes, right? And put them together. So there are 13 stripes in the American flag and we used each one to, to uh, represent a different social justice issue. In this case, it's literacy and access to education. Um, and this woman was making basically rows of books. And then this is the star part of the quilt. And then here is a couple of images of this quilt put together. So I, I really was just a facilitator for a weekend of helping people sort of uh, generate their idea and then figure out a way to execute the idea. The piecework and the quilting were all done by members of Social Justice Sewing Academy. And then, yeah, this quilt is huge. Um, as I said, they tend to be. All right. I um, I just have one more quilt to share, and I'm going to read this quilt before I share it. It's just going to take a few minutes. Historian Arthur Howard Zinn on the importance of what you choose to emphasize. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents and to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. So the last community quilt. In June of 2022, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. And um, for many of us, this was a realization that half of the population had just had a right taken away, um, the right to reproductive health care and the right to make decisions about our own bodies. And this was, um, pretty upsetting to me. So I thought maybe I would make a community quilt. I solicited quilt blocks from every single state and the District of Columbia, by, created by quilt artists in each of those states, representing their feelings about reproductive rights and what is happening in their states. I then realized, as I mentioned before, with the Memphis quilt and with the home quilt, that the overarching symbol would be the uterus. And for those of you who are technical, the fallopian tubes would be the, um, the structure of the quilt. And the, it has become what I call the United States of uterus. These are all the blocks. You may, you may notice that some of them are made by very famous quilt artists, and some of them are made um, by people that you don't know. Um, 
and I am in the process of putting them together. Uh, it's always sort of overwhelming and daunting to think about these blocks and how to build a community, how to stitch that story together. And that is what I'm working on right now. So um, stay tuned. And this is a short list of the links, some of the links that are in that link pack. And that's what I've got for you folks today. Um, I hope you have a little bit of time for questions and thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. That was a really wonderful, inspiring presentation. Um, just seeing how people's creative energy was um, really touched by your whole process. You made it possible for so many people to, to participate um, and then found a way to bring together what they had created in just beautiful, beautiful ways. Thank you very much. We're going to just uh, probably go over a little bit so I can sneak in questions that people had. Um, and the first one is, how do you finance getting the supplies that you need to create these huge quilts? Well, a lot of it is me, um, but there is um, most, I want to say all of the quilts, except for the home quilt, were really financed by um, grants. And a lot of times the grants have matching funds components to them. So the matching funds would be me donating materials and my time. And so combination of that. Um, so mm -hmm. writing grants is, and I think funding organizations are very receptive to funding a project like this because there's, there's something that happens in the community and there's also a tangible product that can be shared by the community. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, when you're working with children, do you ever find that they have a hard time letting go of the block that they've created? Um, or do they you know, really want to take it home? Well, in that first community quilt for Thread, there were only two kids that participated. And one of the it was my son and his friend, whose mom was the executive director, and he wouldn't give his block up. <laughs> so the block is not part of the quilt. It was quite this uh, discussion between the two of them, but he was very attached to his block. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's been my experience as well. Um, somebody asked whether you're planning on doing a book about the community quilt projects. Yeah, I think about it. I would like to, because then it would allow people to have a resource so that they could uh, make them. And, you know, seeing them all together is really cool. So to have mm -hmm. them continue book would be really awesome yeah um and then um somebody asked um do you ever need to not include a block because it um might be a problem or uh, because it might offend people or do you need to modify things besides the glue problem which i am familiar with you know, that's an interesting question. I always try to just work with what I have. And I've, every time I, in the quilts I've made, every block that was given to me is included in the quilt. Now, the quilt that I'm working on right now, United States of Uterus, which is interesting because that is the first time where I'm really working with professionals. A lot of the people involved in the quilt are professional quilt artists. And I gave very specific guidelines and they didn't listen, right? <laughs> they made their blocks too big. They put things on them that I now I have to worry about whether or not I can iron the block. They have <laughs> made them three dimensional, like all that. And I said very specifically. So that's going to be an interesting challenge with this particular quilt is that I am dealing and, you know, each each one of those blocks is a, is a tiny work of art. So mm -hmm. that is going to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then I think the last question, because we're at the top of the hour, um, I know you said with the um, Social Justice Sewing Academy that there, the 
participants of the social justice group did the quilting for the other projects are you doing all of that piecing and quilting yourself yes yeah wow so it's a <laughs> it, it's an undertaking and i get a little, little behind on deadlines so mm -hmm. yeah 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 well that is just a, a very impressive achievement in and of itself but um what a wonderful inspirational presentation um, a lot of people are posting that they now know what they're going to do with the scraps they have at home and so i think we'll be seeing a lot more community quilts thank you so much for joining us today everybody else please tune in next week when the international quilt museum will be um presenting uh, some wonderful pictorial and landscape quilts by an artist named Anna Maria Brenti. So, and um, I hope that you'll join us again. Maria, thank you. It was great. Oh, thank you very much.